Thank you. I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes, um, and then Catherine will do her own presentation. And I guess um, uh, part of the reason I'm talking at, at all is because um, I actually asked Catherine to present a version of this at a conference that I organized uh, at Barclays. Um, and I think one of the things we both thought would, would be useful about it is a, is a slight introduction on kind of how this would, how the coming um, uh, accounting changes to uh, international accounting standards will potentially impact not all, only the work that you do, but how uh, the profound impact it could potentially have on the work um, that uh, investors do and quantitative investors in particular do. And so that's what I'd like to, to talk about today. Um, in terms of quantitative investing, uh, really I think about quant investing as a, a set of tools. Um, and uh, you can apply them to a variety of asset classes, really any asset class. Uh, I work in equities, um, uh, but you know, the accounting data is used throughout. Um, and for me, it really kind of almost begs the question of what is quant investing? And for me, it's just really the rigorous use of data to backtest and create wholesale trading rules that have minimal uh, human intervention. Uh, in them, and there's really no reason why, again, this can't be applied to any asset class anywhere. Uh, and I know people who are running uh, strategies, quantitative strategies, uh, in, in all of these asset classes. Um, within equities, uh, there's a variety of um, investment um, uh, classes, uh, in ver a variety of investment styles, uh, and generally they're broken down by their, their holding period. Um, and I think that generally when people talk about quants, there's a, there's a great confusion about, you know, what really, you know, how these kind of styles are, 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 are being used. And so I, I just wanted to kind of take a few seconds to just kind of separate some of this out. Uh, there's stat arms and, and ultra high frequency that, you know, I think many people confuse a lot of what quant is with that. Um, you know, those are the places that you hear about often, you know, with the flash orders and all that kind of controversy. And you see people literally holding seconds to intraday. Um, you know, I know clients who are actually trading, you know, thousands of stocks per second. Um, uh, accounting data probably will not be terribly useful in that. Um, uh, high frequency, there are, you know, days. Um, again, it's not clear how useful accounting data will be uh, in, in that. Um, medium frequency to weeks, and then there is lower frequency months to quarters. Uh, and I think you see more accounting data being used in the medium uh, to low frequency. Uh, horizon. I think that one thing that most people aren't aware of um, is literally today from our estimates at Barcap um, uh, that 50% of all daily trading volume is accounted for by the stat arb traders. So literally 60, and that may even be low, it may be close to up to 70% of all trading volume is done on the NYSE, uh, Amex, NASDAQ, is done uh, stat arb, not humans uh, doing it uh, with holding periods again of <coughs> seconds to days. Uh, to, to, to intraday. Um, the bulk of assets and low frequency tra strategies, uh, which are fundamentally driven, uh, have, um, uh, I, I agree with Ken that we've been, um, actually had a very hard time uh, as of late, uh, where we're probably down in assets close to 50% uh, at, at this point, uh, right around the top of uh, the quant bubble. Uh, we were up to somewhere around 1.8 trillion out of a market cap in the US <laughs> of, uh, 12 to 13 trillion, so we were getting to be a decent size. Uh, now we're getting to be insignificant again. Um, in terms of uh, kind of, of the low frequency strategies, in general, um, and that's what I want to talk about, there are three types of strategies generally that I think about. Um, uh, and I think this sometimes is less well understood that we talk about both mean reverting strategies, valuation strategies, something is depressed and it's going to revert back the other way. Uh, there's generally trend chasing strategies. Uh, there, that really only seems to me to be the only two real kind of possibilities or something's going to continue in its way or it's going to revert back. Um, and then quality seems to be more generally mean reversion, um, but um, we can debate that. Uh, and, and in terms of the signals, there are generally uh, three types of signals I like to think about in terms of fundamental signals, uh, and this is what most people do. Uh, technical signals, or then there's kind of more proprietary, non-traditional signals. Uh, things uh, like Joey was talking about, um, uh, you know, for example, the Google search would be kind of, I think, uh, more of the proprietary indicators that people are starting to develop uh, at, at this point. And I, I think 
the really the hard part in the low frequency strategies is really separating out signals from noise um, uh, in in these. Um, and you know the re the way that you're going to have to do that really is through long back steps because these are very low uh, signal to noise uh, um, uh, signals. Um, and so accounting data really is key in this uh, for us. Um, and I think that that's for a reason. Um, one is that fundamental, uh, in, in, in these lower frequency strategies, what you're really trying to do is undercover a fundamental value um, that they're inherently low to noise to signal, low signal to noise. Uh, and so you're learning about this profitability over long, long time. It's gonna take a while to come back. You're not gonna get reversions to uh, fundamental value happening immediately. Uh, so you need to have, and you need a relatively stationary environment to kind of learn um, about these uh, signals um, and, and, and understand what your profitability on these signals are going to be. Um, you know, these signals also, because they're low, inherently um, low signal to noise, you need to have a relatively consistent uh, time series of data with stable characteristics. Uh, if my, the underlying characteristics of and, and components of what that signal is being coming is changing dramatically over time, that's a problem. You're not having really the same signal. And it's very hard to learn about it. Um, uh, and then, you know, ideally you want the frequency of the data that you're getting, the, si the underlying signal that you're getting to somehow be close to lining up with your holding period of your strategy, right? So if you're getting uh, a signal, right, inherently like, you know, a quarterly annual signal and you're trading you know, by seconds, that just doesn't work, right? So um, you, you want this kind of nice alignment. Uh, and you, you're getting, and this is why, I mean, right, I mean, accounting data just works for low frequency quants in, in all this kind of way. It's just natural. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, gap really helps us um, in all of this, right? It, it makes, you know, accounting data attractive to use uh, because exactly it has the ease of comparability across firms. Uh, as a quant, I'm not buying one, because these are, again, low signal to noise um, kind of variables or factors. Uh, I'm betting against the whole cross section of stocks. A lot, you don't have to do this, but it's very natural to do this, right? I want to bet, take a thousand bets um, uh, in, in the cross section, and gap works because it gives me comparability across firms that's easy to use, and it gives me a high level of consistency across time. Um, so uh, that works for for me and, and exactly what we're doing. Um, you know, let me just, a, a few of the signals that we're using, um, you know, uh, there's the kind of more traditional signals, uh, book to price, sales to price, as we all know, there's other ones which, you know, may be or may not be in some of the <coughs> academic literature. Uh, you know, change in employees is not a variable that until very recently I had actually seen uh, surface into the academic literature. There's an NBR paper about a year, year and a half ago that mm -hmm. Uh, found it, um, it's there, it works. Um, you know, order backlog is actually more controversial, lining it up with returns, you can, or eh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, we've, everyone uh, out there uses accruals, right? Uh, maybe that's why it's disappeared, and controversial about that, but you know, we take, we'll take a version of a modified Jones model, we'll do that, and then we actually use a whole bunches of um, industry specific variables, we'll go out and call reports and figure out every way that we can, we can do that, and there are <coughs> databases out there um, that are certainly helping us. Um, uh, you know, one variable that we certainly use a lot is one of the uh, variables that we like is ROIC. Um, and, you know, to take, you know, there's, of course, as we all know here in this room, there are many, many ways uh, to calculate it, but, uh, you know, for the purposes of what Catherine's going to talk about, um, uh, shoot, um, uh, you know, you're, you know, we are, we are, we are, when you use a signal like that, you are heavily using information coming off financial statements uh, to calculate that. And as those underlying uh, concepts are, and constructs are, are changing, uh, that will have a large impact on what we're doing. Um, and so, because uh, I'm running, I don't want to take more of Catherine's time, what, but basically, the, as we deploy them, there's really, I think, two ways of doing it. One, and, and I mentioned, there's a relative approach um, that I, I need to do, I want to go create uh, if I'm running cross-sectional signals, I want to go run Fama Macbeth cross-sectional regressions. I want to take those coefficients that I'm getting out of those Fama Macbeth cross-sectional regressions. I can interpret them as a unit return on my signal. Um, and then I will test the stability of those returns over time. Um, so, uh, you know, and then I can make use those returns 
uh, those, those time series of returns from the cross-sectional regressions to understand whether I should be betting on that factor or not. Uh, so I'm really using, both in that construct, really relying on <coughs> the reliability and comparability of cross firms, and I'm really relying on the consistency um, uh, of the accounting variables. Uh, and then another way I might just do is just take a time series variable and just try and bet uh, uh, according to some sort of the time series co you know, uh, characteristics. And again, again, then I'm really um, relying a lot of, uh, on the time consistency of my accounting uh, principles and variables. Um, so what really has me very, very nervous about a move to IFRS um, is that it could potentially <laughs> uh, wipe out both of these principles for me. Uh, and then where am I going to be left? Um, and if it does a bad enough job, I really have no idea what I would do. I'd, I would literally have, you know, all those kind of signals that I was talking about before um, make up a decent, you know, percent of the weight in my model, um, and I'll have a problem. Um, and uh, I don't, you know, I have a hard enough time finding accounting PhDs who are versed in GAAP um, to come work for me, believe it or not. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, how am I going to find someone who is going to be ex not only knowledgeable in GAAP, um, but also in IFRS and can help me change my model from one to the other is certainly something that I worry about a lot if these kind of changes go through. So with that, I'll kind of turn it over to Kathy. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Thank you, Matthew. So uh, the slides that I'm going to use will be placed on the conference website. So I'm not, I'm not going to read to you what's on these slides. If you want, if you have an interest in them, you can download them and do anything you want to with them. It, it won't be a PDF. You can change them, whatever you like. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, make these comments to you. Um, our plan is that I'll talk for a while, and then we're going to have 10 minutes of questions at the end between 4 and 4.10. So. My overview is to talk about some process issues, including the SEC's stated decision process and its stated criteria, and emphasize the current state of uncertainty about the outcome and the timing of this possible change, and then talk about substantive differences that might, substantive issues, differences that might arise if the SEC decides to move to IFRS. And my comment here is that I'm using statement numbers, not codification. That's a point I'm going to return to at, at the end. So in terms of process issues, um, and again, I am not going to read these slides to you. <laughs> Only two big economies, the United States and Japan, have not announced that they plan to use or have started using some version of IFRS. Of course, what we don't know at this point is how much those jurisdictions that have changed the standards, we don't know how much they've changed them. And we don't know how big the implementation differences are. So at this point, although the IASB will tell you that standards that are IFRS or IFRS-like are being used a lot of places, we don't know the extent to which it is literally the same standard. Now for many years, in fact since 2002, the FASB and IASB have committed to be working on these large convergence projects. It's been eight years and there's quite a few projects that are underway with a completion timetable of 2011. Right now, Matthew's work faces explicit non-comparability because non-USS, non-US SEC registrants, of which there's about 400, have a free choice between using IFRS as promulgated by the IASB, US GAAP, or something else with a 20F reconciliation. So the SEC has put into our financial reporting system an, an intentional, explicit non-comparability. We don't know how big it is. We don't know what the implications are. Now, what about these proposals? Well, the, um, the, Cox, the, the Cox SEC came forward with the 2008 proposal. Uh, Mr. Cox left. Ms. Shapiro came. Everyone wondered if Ms. Shapiro had the same appetite for convergence. As of February of 2010, the SEC confirmed, yes, the appetite for, for um, a single set of high-quality global standards is still there. This document is about 72 pages long, of which 46 is the work plan. So for our purposes, the contents are in the work plan because that lays out the criteria for the decision and, in very general terms, a description of how OCA, Jim Croker's OCA, is going to undertake this. 
Now, for our purposes, I would say there are some things of this that are more interesting than others. First of all, they claim that they're going to evaluate the comprehensiveness, auditability, and forceability of IFRS and comparability. And I, wa I want to see how they're going to do that because we don't know how to do that. So uh, how are they going to know how to do that? The second thing they're worried about is whether we're going to know what to do. And that's the human capital readiness uh, and investor knowledge. So all of us can interrogate ourselves internally as to how good a job we're doing preparing our students to do IFRS. One issue that I think is potentially um, a major impediment is the second one. And the reason I think that is that on April 5th of 2010, the European Union's new Internal Markets Commissioner, a man named Michel Barnier, made a speech in which he asserted that the IASB's funding should be linked to its governance and that he thought the governance is, is currently defective. Specifically, he wants to see more banks, more corporations, and more prudential regulators represented on the IASB's governing board. And he believes that the funding of the IASB should be linked to these individuals appearing on the governing board. Um, he says it's premature to expect the European Union to consider increasing its funding for the IASB absent these governance changes. And of course, there are some implications for the SEC's decisions process. Based on um, the February 2010 decisions, the SEC has said that it will decide in 2011 whether to permit or require IFRS for U.S. SEC registrants, and it proposes a lengthy transition that would begin no earlier than 2015, meaning it could begin later and it could be based on size. We know that the Sarbanes-Oxley 404 requirements were based on size. We all saw how that worked out. So we could imagine a lengthy period during which the amount of non-comparability in U.S. SEC registrants reporting could be extreme, with larger firms moving to IFRS and then medium-sized and then smaller, and I'm not sure what will happen there. It is unclear whether this conversion might happen all at once in a wholesale conversion or be some group of standards one at a time. The SEC has made it very clear that a key condition in their decision will be the status of the convergence projects. So this means that the SEC plans to look at what's going on in the convergence projects. And so what I prepared on this slide is a partial list of the FASB, IASB joint convergence projects with um, completion dates, all of which are in 2010 and 2011. So I believe that absent convergence, the impetus for these projects would be quite different. However, these are the projects, and they propose to make a variety of changes in measurement, recognition, classification, and display. We have no idea at this point how these wholesale changes, if they're implemented, would affect things like CompuStat, because the current classifications in CompuStat are not consistent with what the financial statements would look like under these proposed changes nor do I believe that XBRL tagging is necessarily up to speed with these changes. And certainly, we do not have a sense of what would happen to a quant model like Matthews, where you, you would not have a time series of data to do the estimation, let alone the back testing. So, so how does this work? Well, let me give you something easy first, and that's LIFO. People go, ha ha, LIFO, that's easy. No, that's not easy, because although there aren't that many LIFO users, they're very big, so they're in your trading rules. So there aren't that many of them, but they're all big companies. So they're in the trading rules in a lot of cases. Now, we don't know what will happen under the Obama administration because there have been some proposals to get rid of LIFO altogether to grab those, those back taxes. So I don't know what will happen. So let's take that one aside and focus on something that I think is more likely to be an impediment, and that's the, the way loss recognition happens in IFRS and U.S. GAAP. And there's two clear instances. The first one is non-financial asset impairments, where unlike the U.S. GAAP two-step approach, where all you have to do is get the undiscounted cash flows, you have a much stricter test in IFRS, and you have reversals. So that means you're more likely to get an impairment, I think, and you can get a reversal. There are no reversals in U.S. GAAP, although Bob Hers, as the sole decision maker for agenda setting at the FASB, has said he'd like to see convergence in this area. Um, I have no sense that this has happened so far. Also with regard to loss contingencies, 
IAS 37 explicitly defines probable as more likely than not. Practice in the United States, higher than 51%. Uh, the measurement of the recognized loss contingencies may also differ. However, in 2005, the IASB promulgated an exposure draft which would have changed provision, contingency loss recognition in, in IFRS to be quite different from US GAAP. And they have been very close to issuing a final standard for several months now. If they issue this standard, they're going to do away with the probability recognition threshold and replace it with something that looks an awful lot like expected value type measurement. Meaning that loss contingency recognition under IFRS would not look like US GAAP in terms of recognition and measurement. These other two things are kind of small, but if you're running a trading rule based on the balance sheet, one of them has to do with the classification of items as, as current liabilities. This is the covenant violation issue. The other one is convertible debt, where IFRS requires an explicit separation of the debt host and the call option using some fairly simple arithmetic. But in the United States, that separation occurs only with a narrow class of instruments with cash settlement provisions. So the... Um, Continuing with this, I tried to pick some things that would, would speak to Matthew's ROIC, return on invested capital. So that the definition of invested capital in IFRS would include the development part of research and development. So whereas you do not have development costs on the balance sheet in US GAAP except for this statement 86 software thing, you got a lot of them in IFRS. So the return on invested capital, the definition of invested capital is different. Depreciation is different because IFRS requires component depreciation. We know that the AICPA proposed component depreciation in this country and had to retreat from that proposal because preparers said it was too difficult. It is in IFRS. Uh, we also know that in terms of measuring return on invested capital, IFRS permits or requires different kinds of fair value measurements with some of the more interesting examples being investment property where there's free choice between a fair value type measure and historical cost. Bob Hurst says that he thinks the FASB should address that. A general revaluation approach for plant property and equipment and also there's a special standard in IFRS for biological assets that's very fair value oriented. So the balance sheets don't look the same and there's a lot of industry specific uh, type effects in these measurements. Also, the income statements don't look the same. One of Matthew's indicators is R&D, expenditures divided by sales. Well, IFRS permits items to be shown both by function, so you'd see R&D, and by nature. And an IFRS income statement that displays, displays expenses by nature doesn't show R&D. It's not there. You can't get it. Now, the FASB and IASB have proposed to solve this problem by requiring preparers to give you an income statement with both. So you'd have them both. We all know how to analyze a statement of cash flows to pick up that excess tax benefit um, from exercises of employee share options. Well, you can certainly find it easily in US GAAP, but you've got to hunt for it in IFRS because it doesn't specify where it has to be shown, including, for example, in other in the operations section. So you see some examples here where things that are very specified in US GAAP in one way are either not specified or specified another way in IFRS. So the existing differences in classification and display suggest to me that somebody who's working with these things might have to sit down and do a variety of direct adjustments to the numbers to be able to use them. I also think that this is an this next one is an arena where I don't think we know what the implications are, but let me try to explain what I have in mind here. In the United States, we spend a lot of time trying to work out the implementation guidance, so, and the idea is this is what you should do. This is what you should expect. Whereas in IFRS, there's a different approach, which I'll call the you figure it out approach, which is sometimes called principles-based standards. The implication of this might be, if you wanted to be really pejorative about this, is that IFRS are vague and therefore you don't have a lot of specificity, so therefore you have a greater dispersion in reporting choices. If you have a greater dispersion in reporting choices, what does this do to the comparability of the numbers? 
And I'm not talking about explicit non-comparability like the fair value option. I'm talking about implicit non-comparability where you cannot see those implementation decisions. Now, I don't know how this conundrum will be resolved. Will the United States forge forward in a brave new world of you figure it out accounting? Will the FASB continue to set implementation guidance or will there be some other solution? However, absent the degree of specificity that is available in US GAAP, you don't always know what the implementation decisions are in, in one of these more broadly framed standards. So what's going on? Well, just to give a, a sense of how different things could be, I picked out a few projects, and these are very, very broad kind of statements about how different things could be. So the idea behind this financial statement presentation project is to create guidance that says, this is how you should set up your income statement, your balance sheet, and your statement of cash flows. There's a due process document out there, and the boards are moving forward with something that looks like this. So the, all three statements would have a business section that contains operating and investing, a financing section, an income taxes section, and discontinued operations, and there would be a single statement of comprehensive income, and that looks pretty good in terms of comparability. Well, the boards in their um, discussion paper proposed that the categories that you see here for business and financing would be determined by management. That is, management would determine using that business model what belongs in the business section and what belongs in the financing section, would also do classifications of income and expenses and would lay out the display. So this would be based on the entity's business model. Um, the proposal here is not to tell everyone to do the income statement the same way, but to specify the objective that management is supposed to achieve. Now, as of last September, the boards stopped using the phrase management approach to describe this, but they didn't get rid of the idea. They kept the idea. So this idea, which says that the way you do something for accounting purposes depends on your business model, is around in accounting, because that's what segment reporting is based on. And we have it in some other places where we don't seem to be very bothered by it. If, for example, you have a very large piece of earth-moving equipment, if you're a dealer, that's your inventory. If you're in the construction business, that's your plant property and equipment. And the accounting for them is very different. This takes the idea that the way you do your accounting is a function of your business model and extends it to classification and display. One of the open issues, and I think it's an empirical issue, is something like this. What would this approach do to change the decision usefulness of financial reports? It would certainly make things different certainly make things different. And it might result in the same asset being accounted for differently by different entities, and that may or may not increase decision usefulness. So continuing with this, with financial statement presentation, there are proposals to create whole new areas of information. For example, separating remeasurement items from all other changes. So this is a columnar presentation, and your changes in net assets would be divided into those that arise from remeasurements a term whose definition I have not fully internalized, and all other changes. So I, I'm not sure what that would mean, but it would be new information. Now, it's also the case that the boards have undertaken a project which would not just change how income statements and balance sheets are displayed, it would change what's on them. Now, this matters, of course, because you can't see the assets that aren't consolidated. All you get to see is the equity method, line item, or, or something else. So consolidation policy really matters. We know what it is in the United States where we separate voting interest entities from variable interest entities, and, and the voting ones, we count the votes. Under this proposal, there would be none of this. There would be no more of this. You instead use this qualitative definition of control with an ability to direct criterion and a benefits criterion you want to generate returns. The INSB and FASB have been debating this recently, and they've been focusing a lot on the ones where you, you would count the votes or analyze the votes. And they're having some trouble because they're fine as long as somebody owns more than 51%. They're not fine when you get below 50%. When should you consolidate? Well, when you meet the two criteria, ability to direct and the benefit. Well, how do you know if you've met those if you're below 50%? And the debate seems to 
turn on the indicators that should be provided for preparers and auditors to use to demonstrate that an entity is in control now. And then the question is, does it have to demonstrate that it must perpetuate control? Now, for those who think that this is going to work out pretty well, I will tell you that this definition of control, which is proposed now to be put in place um, by 2011, was proposed in similar form by the FASB in 1995 and 1999. And both of those exposure drafts failed for a lack of constituent support. So either things have changed a lot in the last decade or so, or we're going to be in trouble again on this. Revenue recognition. Here is one where I think that there is a possibility that for some entities, nothing will change. Their revenue recognition won't change a bit. However, the rule that the FASB and IASB have put forward says you focus on a contract with a customer and you recognize revenue as you deliver goods and services to that customer. Implemented literally the way it's written, this would rule out anything that is like the percentage of completion method, anything that's like it. So you'd have to transfer that item to the customer. Uh, the customer consideration would be allocated using a rule that's a lot like EITF 081 and the onerous contract rules would obtain. Now, here's where things could become different because this revenue recognition standard proposes to recognize revenue not based on an earnings process concept, but on a control concept. When the customer receives control of the item, the seller recognizes revenue. And in order to make this work, the FASB and IASB have put forward indicators of control. And this, is a, this slide doesn't show all of them, it shows some of them. You'll notice here that one of them is the customer has an unconditional obligation to pay and the payment is non-refundable. Now, US GAAP has got a whole standard for dealing with that problem in its statement 48. That's not part of this proposal, all that re allowance for returns. So I don't, I don't really know what's going on with revenue recognition. It could change things a little, could change things a lot. The reason I bring it up primarily is to give a background on lease accounting, where for a number of years, um, persons have been upset about the fact that if you change the lease contract a little, you change the accounting a lot, it seems like a, a good way to introduce non-comparability. So the proposals that the boards are considering is to do away with the operating and capital lease distinction and to focus on rights to use and obligations to pay. So anybody who had a lease and was a lessee would have to recognize an asset for the right to use and an obligation for the liability to pay and factor in things like renewal options and bargain purchases into the measurement. What is more interesting, I think, is not lessee accounting, but rather lessor accounting, which is revenue recognition. Under the revenue recognition approach for lessors that is consistent with the board's other revenue recognition model, the lessor would not derecognize the leased asset, keep it on the books, it would recognize a receivable, and it would recognize a performance obligation. So now the asset is there, the receivable is there, the liability is there it would derecognize the performance obligation over the course of the lease. However, the FASB and IASB are also considering whether there is such a thing as a lease that is an in-substance sale in which the lessor would derecognize the asset. Here's a parenthetical expression. The notion of an in-substance sale is the historical originator, origination of the capital lease concept in Statement 13. And the basis for conclusions makes it clear that the board was trying to identify an in-substance sale when it put those criteria in for capital leases. So it's back. Furthermore, having decided on this lessor approach, at the March 23, 2010 meeting, the IASB said, we're not so sure we might want to have the lessor derecognize the asset. So the lease proposals have now diverged from the revenue recognition proposal because of this performance obligation derecognition conflict. And they've also started creating a um, divergence between the IASB and FASB as, as to approaches. The project on financial instruments, my personal favorite, started out with a goal to reduce the complexity of the guidance for financial instruments, resolve problems around hedge accounting, and create a single high quality standard. And what's happened so far is that the IASB got ahead of the FASB and issued a standard on financial assets only, which is 
not convergent with the FASB's proposals, and the FASB has yet to do anything. So what did the IASB do? Uh, well, it, last fall it issued IFRS 9, which said this is our first step in replacing IAS 39, and we, we wanted to do liabilities, but we took them out of the standard because it was too hard, and so we're not going to have a, a choice. It's, not a cho it's a constrained choice between amortized cost and fair value. So here's the rule. Amortized cost items must meet two criteria. First, the item must be managed so as to collect the contractual cash flows. So you're, you don't plan to sell it. You want to collect the contractual cash flows. But you notice that the entity need not hold the asset to maturity. So I, I asked um, a national office partner for one of the big four, well, does that mean that they could sell them anytime they want? And he said, sure, it doesn't say you can't. So this is like a held to maturity debt instrument that you can sell anytime you want and you carry it at amortized cost. Except that there's also a contractual cash flows test that says that the contractual terms of the instrument must specify only principal and interest. Except that if the instrument was issued by an entity in a way that creates a concentration of credit risk, the holder of the instrument has to look at the assets in the issuing entity. I don't know how to do that. Uh, the examples in the, at the uh, end of the, the standard which explain how you look into the issuing entity to analyze the assets didn't help me a bit, especially if I couldn't get the balance sheet of the issuing entity. So continuing, the fair value items are debt instruments held as assets and not otherwise classified, except there's also equity instruments where you could put the changes in OCI, except that, except that. So what we have here is cost and fair value and floor accepts that um, for, for financial assets. And one thing that I think, Matthew, would make me crazy if I were in your position is that if I have a, an equity security that I designate with fair value changes through OCI, I still have to put the dividends in my income statement. So the two pieces of return on one of these equity instruments appear in two different places, OCI and net income. So what's the FASB doing? Well, they have proposed to address everything all at once, assets, liabilities, the whole thing. And their proposal is much more fair value-ish than IFRS 9. Um, their proposal is we're going to put everything that's in the scope of the standard at fair value except for core deposits, except that you may be able to take your debt instruments that you intend to pay off at maturity carry them at fair value on the balance sheet, fair value changes in OCI, and some other exceptions around equity instruments. This slide so shows some other changes that are um, being proposed by the FASB. Now, my final statement about this is that in a speech made on March 30th, David Tweedy stated that he thought the most likely outcome in the financial instruments arena would be non-convergence as of 2011. So to the extent that you think the accounting for financial instruments is a core issue in convergence, Sir David Tweedy, who's going to be the chairman of the IASB until 2011, says his most likely outcome assessment is it's not going to happen. So where does this leave us? Well, it, it leaves us with what I would call a great deal of uncertainty. I would call this, um, if I were Donald Rumsfeld, I would call this a known unknown um, because we know that the SEC said we're, we're going to think about this and try to make a decision in 2011, except that we're going to look at these major convergence projects, but we don't know how many of them will be completed and what form they will take. Regardless of that, the FASB and IASB major projects will, if they're carried to fruition, change U.S. GAAP in a wholesale way, creating a dislocation in Matthew's time series uh, in ways that I'm not sure how users of financial reports, and that includes us, will, will be able to adjust. Now the final thing, which is a final process issue, is those of us who have been struggling to learn the codification realize that U.S. GAAP has been codified and no longer uses statement numbers. However, IFRS isn't. So save that disk on codification because you may or may not need it. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, we've allocated 10 minutes if you have any questions or comments.
May I open up for questions, please? that they're not tolerable. Um, I, know your, I know your background here and on a model where, you know, it's a series and there are certainly things, I, I try to do everything specific within an industry um, and do only comparability within industries. Um, uh, I certainly don't want to try and do market comparisons, market-wide comparisons. I look at generally firms of the same size. Uh, I try to back out as much as I can, and I hold my nose and bet on large numbers of stocks. So, so things like leases, uh, financial instruments, pensions, and a few others, clearly you <coughs> lead to, within the industry, lack of comparability under some circumstances, under U.S. gas. So that was sort of one question. But the second question, So don't you have this problem with gas tax? And the fact is that there's a lot of individuals that are being assessed. Uh, IFRS might be the excuse for the catalyst for the you know, convergence issues with that. But when you're doing time series-based models, you have a problem. I mean, we've had this problem always. In the US gas Absolutely. Um, and, you know, and, we, and we've seen problems come up and go, I mean, right, you know, at some times and recognition of goodwill to, to all the sorts of problems that come up. But I think we're talking about something more than a degree here. I mean, we're talking about something much more of a, of a kind. Um, and you're going to have, an, and, and it's not just going to affect one signal, right? We can, we can always say, you know, look, okay, you know, recognition of goodwill. We'll, we'll, we'll take one variable out of our model and we can, and we can, you know, go around and deal with that as best we can. But we're, we're talking about something much more systematic going across the entire balance sheet income statement at a single moment in time that is going to be much, much more disruptive than piecemeal changes that have come in. Come oh, in don't get me wrong. I think you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right, but, 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 but I, 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 at least the way I understand it, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because you guys are much more uh, expert than I am, but, but this seems different than what we've been dealing with in the past. It, it really, Trevor, I don't think people know how big the changes are going to be. Because there's, there's sleeper changes sitting in those standards, like the way you account for the tax effects of employee call options is very different in IFRS than it is in U.S. GAAP, and it's just sitting in there as a number that will, will come and get you depending on exactly the specifics. So I don't think anybody knows. And furthermore, I don't think that anybody knows whether this is going to be a big deal or a little deal. I, I agree. I, all I'm saying is that you take the employee stock option tax. Mm -hmm. it, it used to be that people could classify that in operating yeah. stock or in equity, mm -hmm. and they just unified it in, in, in the, the, the time series segment of it. So you have that built into it. So these things have Yes, John. Just sort of a follow up on my brother's point. Um, it, it, the way the gauge plan would actually you know, lead to other countries that have switched. And there, I think you probably can make the argument that the changes will also be even more dramatic. So, one thing we could do is in one part of the model, you know, sort of do back pricing, you know, sort of before IFRS, after IFRS, and sort of see how much this whole interest rate cycle sort of sort of change. And now, obviously, it's not trivial because of the time period change that we have ac across this, but it is a trivial way to gauge it, and, and, and I think there's mitigating factors. I mean, you know, we're, we're scaling a lot of these, these, these variables that we're using, and, uh, and that maybe gives some of these effects. So it's not obvious to me that the effects are that much stronger than what the national average is. Uh, that's, that's 
So, Christian, one of the reasons that people can run these big trading rules in the United States is we got so many companies and they go back so long. So you get outside the United States, so there's Japan, take them off the table because they don't use IFRS or anything like it. So then the next big economy is the UK. And I agree with you that you could take some of these ideas and implement them on UK data, but the big problem is that in a lot of other jurisdictions, you don't have 8,000 registrants running back all these years. So the thing you're talking about, which I think is a great idea, I'm not sure you can do it in the way that Matthew would like to do it in a lot of other countries, with the notable exception in my mind being the UK. So I agree with that problem, although you, you say the UK would have been the one that I would have jumped on. Mm -hmm. There was a lot else going on in the market that's part of the problem, though, when, 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 in 2000, 2001, 2002, uh, including the euro and a whole bunch of other things that made um, a lot of effects of trying to disentangle what was, I mean, it would be nice if we had a nice stable period in the market at that exact moment, but we didn't. It was part of the issue. <coughs> I've got a couple opinion questions for, for Catherine. My, my name is Jay Hansen. I'm a National Director of Accounting at McGladdery's. I'm currently an EITF member as well as Chair of uh, AXEC. And, at our AXEC meeting this week, we had a discussion about uh, what do we think is really going to happen with, uh, for, at the SEC in, in 2011, and, and trying to take the pulse of thumbs up, thumbs down. Do we think it's more than a, more than more likely than not that, that they're actually going to uh, implement the IFRS? So I'd just like to hear your crystal ball on that. And then a second question that kind of goes along with it as we're debating what are the most significant, uh, this work plan is many pages long, and there's got to be a couple really big deals in there, and the rest of it will just fall into place. And, and uh, one, one of the questions we were debating was, what makes a standard a high quality standard and how are they ever gonna assess that in 2011 when the ink won't even be dry on them? So I think I noted in my presentation that I personally wanna see how the SEC is gonna go about doing these assessments because I can't figure out how to assess these things. Uh, and I know that it's dangerous for somebody like me who's an outsider to make a forecast, but David Tweedy's travel schedule is practically public information. <laughs> and I'm aware that he's been going back and forth to Washington. Um, the information in the financial press indicates that the rest of the world is becoming increasingly impatient with what they call the prolonged convergence process. So those people at the SEC will, in my opinion, make a decision in 2011. Now, what kind of decision would they make? Well, how about one that will make all the problems arise in somebody else's watch. So how about a lengthy deferral of the effective date? Well, they've never done that before, have they? <laughs> and so while it would be a marked departure from past behavior and it would show a, a, just an incredible kicking the can down the road behavior, whoever was the voice from the group that said they've never done that before, of course that's what they're, they're likely to do. And I would think, let's see, the, um, how likely is Mary Shapiro to be there in, 20, 000, in 2017? I don't know. So that's issue one. Um, how, when, would the, when would the date happen? And the second one, of course, is that once that vote happens in 2011, once it happens, then everyone knows that the FASD is irrelevant because the adoption, the effective date is now 2017. So what will happen to everything that's unfinished? I don't know. So I, I personally, I, I'm, I'm glad to be an accountant in such interesting times. Um, it gives me many opportunities to update my teaching materials, and I'm looking forward to that, to that decision, as I'm sure you are as well. <laughs> Quick. Yeah, that's the other thing is 2017 gives those of us who are older an ample opportunity to take early retirement. Give us a sense of the percentage of that that would be the low frequency aspect and would be affected more by this versus the high frequency that presumably wouldn't be as affected by this. 
60% was the high frequency quants. Um, I think that low frequency quants are um, hard to measure. They're not a large Just percentage. Right. It would be I mean, a much I mean, smaller percentage going through that. Correct. That's the trading volume, not the assets. The panels below that gave the assets. Right. Um, and also, this is more, I guess, in your, in your arena, Catherine, just from the standpoint of everything that I look at, the, the financial statement presentation project has more of a chance of keeping me awake at night as a researcher and a teacher than even IFRS at this point because it's hitting sooner potentially. And it's a joint project, and they're saying – Next, you know, second quarter of 2011, final standard. Do do we have a sense of that people aren't awake to this yet, or is that just what I perceive when I talk to companies and auditors and others out there? Well, we have a an accounting professional here in the in the second row, first row that would would be able to tell us whether the profession has its hand on the pulse of the financial statement presentation project. Okay. I mean, the top people in firms that mm -hmm. have an office tell their heads that uh, they spend all their time doing it. But every presentation I do to different CFOs or different uh, our, our professionals, I get a look on their face and go, oh, my God, what are they doing to us? You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. jello shot. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, a company like GE probably has a thousand people all, all over it, but, uh, but the vast majority of companies and, and auditors in America have no idea what's going on. The, the systems changes. That, that is the stuff you have to go in and put in your information systems. The change to do the direct method on the statement of cash flows is, is something that the FASB was informed about by various preparer groups as being considerable, especially if you're trying to do this direct method statement of cash flows and you're a multinational and it's not always easy to get that cash information on a quarterly basis all around the world. So I would say the answer to this is the cost is unknown and highly variable and quite possibly underappreciated. Let alone the remeasurement. Absolutely. Sure, Trevor. Uh, it's sort of interesting because many academics and, and analysts have been advocating for this for a long time and trying to get companies to do it. Um, but I just want to comment on the cash flow for a moment. You know, one of the interesting things is it's probably the information I'll tell you from So that's part of the motivation for doing this. But the, the reality is that the implications of this are really huge. Now, I actually think it's a great opportunity. Because one of the things that happened, one of the reasons they delayed the pension project for so long was most of us don't sort of think about, if you're going to isolate pension costs, which is one of the proposals, a lot of that's sitting in inventory, which is part of this capital ice process that we get to. So this pervasive sort of spider webs all over the place. Actually, I think it just makes us more informed and puts us better and it, it will introduce a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, forecasting and financial statement analysis stuff we'd like to do. Um, but it, it is going to come, frankly, to the respect of IFRS. They are not the ones who are leading this, uh, although they've sort of become taking it over. But it was coming from the FASB as well. This is not an IFRS business. It's a FASB business. Great. May I, may I ask one question? What, what, I, what I wonder is, is to what extent are the firms themselves actually trying to influence this process? They, they must have a stake, you know, to get a clear answer to what is going to happen. You mean the preparers? No, the firms themselves. The firms that... The uh, CPA firms? Yeah. The FASB and IASB have such a complete open due process that you can probably answer that better than I can. Mm. Their meetings with constituents are open to the public and numerous. All comment letters are made publicly available. Uh, there are frequent discussions with uh, the practicing profession. And, and remember, it's against the rules for those boards to make secret deals. And when I was working there, there were no secret deals. So I would say if you want to see what the influence is, 
take a look at the public records. The, the, the people who have the best knowledge about this are the people who have seen both sets of standards in practice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is in, it's residing in big multinationals and in very large CPA firms, and the ones that operate all around the world. And that's not lobbying, that's expertise, where people say this is how it works. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that their, their very um, deep domain knowledge is gonna come to bear on a lot of these issues, and it should. Now, are they self-interested? Sure, but so are we. I mean, Trevor, people like Trevor and me were going, yeah, let me at that income statement, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of an intellectual self-interest. And, 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 and Matthew is saying, well, just give me enough stuff so that I can do the reconciliation, and that's because that's his business model. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? They would like to thank you a lot.